Hello folks, welcome to our compilation of the most entertaining videos for this week. Let's jump right into it. What major plot holes can't you get over? Story 1, Beauty and the Beast, Disney version, has a plot hole I just can't wrap my mind around. At the beginning of the movie, a young prince answers the door and finds an old haggard witch who wants shelter from the cold. The witch curses him for his unkindness by making him a beast. The animation makes it seem like this is maybe an older teen or young adult. They say that if he can't find true love by his 21st year, he will be doomed to be a beast forever. When the story really begins, he is not far from being 21 years old. During Be My Guest, Lumiere mentions that for 10 years we've been rusting and needing so much more than dusting, implying that they've been turned into objects for at least 10 years. So, the prince has been a beast for 10 years and is just about to turn 21. That means when the sorceress turned him into a beast for being rude, he couldn't have been older than 11 years. Where were his parents when the sorceress arrived? Why weren't they also turned into objects or animals? What adult would expect an 11-year-old to be hospitable and selfless? Has that sorceress ever met a preteen before? This could have been solved if they had never said in the opening narration that he'll be cursed forever at 21 years. Look, I'm okay with his parents not being there because, I don't know, rich kid in a castle, I guess a prince or whatever, king and queen, I don't know, they're out. I mean, I guess they're dead because they never came back in those 10 years, or they went on a very long vacation. But yeah, no, 11-year-old kid, I, I've heard that this, I've heard this presented before and yeah, makes no sense. 11-year-old kid is like, no, strange lady, I won't let you into my house. Like. No, that kid did the right thing. Kids, don't let strangers into your house, even if they do threaten to turn you into a beast. Story 2. This one has driven me mad for years. Years! Superman Returns. Oh, God. Lex Luthor's big evil plan makes absolutely no goddamn sense. He wants to use the kryptonite to destroy about half of North America, turning it into a radiated rock, and then what? He talks like the rock is his property, his own country, and he can build housing on it, and people will pay him to live there? What? He expects people will want to live on radioactive land? Also, he doesn't seem to think that there's going to be any reaction to his actions outside of Superman. Forget Superman, he's going to face the might of the US military for what is basically a massive act of terrorism. Does he expect his goons to fight them off? As a matter of fact, forget the military, any decently organized group can sweep in and take him out. There's no end game to his plan. If his goal is just mass destruction, that would be fine, but he seems to think he can benefit and turn a profit on it, and that's absolutely ridiculous. There's no logical way that would be possible. I gotta say it, I liked Lex Luthor a lot better back when he was just stealing 40 cakes. I mean, 40 cakes, that's terrible. Story 3, The Entirety of Twilight. Why didn't the Cullens sparkle during the day? Clouds don't equal the sun ceasing to exist. Why did Jasper go so crazy when Bella got a paper cut in the second book? He goes to a school filled with humans who are filled with blood. Why did Edward try to kill himself when all he had to do was make a quick trip back to Forks to see if she was actually dead or not? Why would Edward leave her for her own safety when he knew about the werewolves, which he was even more worried about? How does Bella get pregnant? According to the book, vampire bodies are frozen in time, but apparently not when it's baby making time, the list goes on. Start from the idiocy of Edward going to school again and again and again over the course of his immortal life because when you're rich and immortal, of course you want to be spending most of your time doing the same thing you've done 50 times before and pretending to have a boring teenage life filled with teenage drama for eternity. Story 4. If Ariel can sign a contract, why can't she write Prince Eric a goddamn note? Dear Eric, I'm the mermaid who saved you. I'm so smitten that I've bargained with the sea witch who wants my father's kingdom, yes, fine, I'm royalty, for a chance to win your heart. She gave me legs, but she took my voice. It's temporary, though. I didn't expect true love to strike in three days, but if you could find it in your heart to kiss me sometime in the next three days, I would get my voice back and my father would retain his kingdom. We could continue to pursue our relationship on whatever footing your human society finds appropriate. <laughs> I said footing. Anyway, I think you're dreamy and I hope you'll kiss me soon. Yours, Ariel. The Little Mermaid isn't exactly a litany of good decision making on Ariel's part. I was gonna say Ariel is from the ocean and Prince Eric is from 
a country, so like they probably don't have the same written language, so he couldn't read it, but they speak the same language. Well, he speaks it and she understands. Eventually she can speak. Like, what? what is happening there? We're going with, like, you know, lazy space, you know, lazy sci-fi thing where every species just happens to speak English. None of this makes sense. That's the plot hole. Why do they speak the same language? Eric should be like, oh, who are you? And she should be like, wong, wong, wong. Story 5, The Walking Dead, or any zombie film for that matter. Apparently the zombies are so strong that they've effectively beaten the military and society is broken down. Still a bunch of ragtag survivors are able to survive with machetes, hammers, and shotguns. Also, why the heck don't they wear thicker clothes? You and your friends get bitten all the time because you wear t-shirts and thin shirts. I like how in Shaun of the Dead they think it's all over, but then the military just waltzes in at the end and restores order. I think that this would be the most likely scenario. A small village or town gets infected, some of the survivors manage to get out and raise the alarm, the military comes in and sanitizes the area. End of crisis. Story 6, Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn. Watched it with an ex who was annoyed by the battle scene as a vision bullcrap, however I was the only person who seemed annoyed that it was a giant plot hole. It stated multiple times throughout the series that Alice cannot see the future where wolves and or Renezme, the little vampire child thing, are concerned and it blocks her ability. Yet the entire battle vision involves wolves. God damn it, Alice, get your crap together. I bet Alice was bluffing. She imagined that scenario and told Aro that it was a vision of the future. Basically threatened the crap out of him and got away with it. Meanwhile, Aro was either unaware of the werewolf limitation, knew but forgot, or was just an idiot. Okay, unfortunately, I have seen these movies, and I will say, I think it might be that Arrow is an idiot. And it's nothing against Michael Sheen, who does an amazing job portraying him, and I'm not just saying that because Michael Sheen is one of my, like, number one Hollywood crushes, please, Michael Sheen, notice me. But I'm saying it because in that movie, when he meets the child, have you seen his response? He's just like, ah, like, there's something not quite right with Arrow. Story 7. In Ant-Man, Hank Pym explains that he's able to shrink people and objects by reducing the space in the atoms, and this means that the person or object retains their mass. This is how we can still deliver an effective punch whilst shrunk. But then we see Scott Lang riding on top of an ant, running up people's arms and other stuff that would be impossible if he still had the mass of a full-grown man. And then there's the several-ton tank that Pym has on his keychain. Great movie otherwise, but this still irks me. Story 8. Spider-Man 2. Okay, so Doc Ock shows up at Harry's house and demands more unobtainium. Harry offers a trade. Bring Spider-Man and he'll give him more unobtainium. Doc Ock asks how to find Spider-Man. Harry points out that Peter Parker takes pictures of Spider-Man and may know how to find him. Doc Ock shows up then and throws a car at the back of Peter Parker's head, which Peter Parker survives by virtue of being Spider-Man, which Doc Ock didn't know about. So in order to get the stuff he wants, he needs Peter's help so he tries to kill him unobtainium unobtainium you fool he's after precious tritium the power of the sun in the palm of my hands Story 9, Barbie, Princess, and the Popper. When they first switch places, the Popper is surprised to get served breakfast in bed, and the maid says, just like every morning, miss. But then later on, the queen discovers her missing because she wasn't at breakfast this morning. Of course she wasn't. She had it in bed every morning. I need answers. Second breakfast, Barbie is a hobbit. Story 10. In Liar Liar, the big reveal at the end is that the prenup is void because Jennifer Tilly's character was a minor when she signed it due to lying about her age to get married. But if she lied about her age to get married, then the marriage would also be void since you can't marry a minor without parental consent and she wouldn't get crap. Story 11. Star Trek Into Darkness was riddled with plot holes bigger than the size of Jupiter. Anyway, the one that bugged me the most is the whole we need Khan alive to save Kirk's life thing. I mean, they had 72 superhuman circles with perfectly good Khan blood to inject into Kirk's dead body, but no, they had to capture Khan stupid but alive while Spock runs around screaming. Story 12. 
All the dialogue in Pokemon games. I can't believe I lost to a kid! You threw out one Pokemon and used self-destruct as your opening move. What did you think was going to happen? Congratulations, you are 10 and can now get your first Pokemon. Good job! Let's go through a 30-minute explanation of Pokemon. Now go beat up that group of 4-5 to five year old preschoolers that all have Pokemon. Don't ask why they get them earlier than you thought. That is definitely the only plot hole in all of the Pokemon games. There's definitely nothing else to question in the construction of that whole setting. Like, no other problems whatsoever that I can see. Story 1. Am I the a-hole for ditching my assigned bridesmaid at a wedding for the one that is younger and a different race as me? I ended up leaving the wedding early. One of my good friends from college was getting married, call him Tom, to his wife, call her Liz, and asked me to be one of his groomsmen. I was honored. I haven't seen him in a while because I live across the country. When I arrived in his city, I was assigned a bridesmaid called Kelly. Now, Kelly is a lovely woman. However, I think we were only assigned to each other because we, bo we are both black. Liz starts telling me that we are both single and perfect for each other, but there was nothing to indicate that at all besides us both being black. I should add as well that Liz had a lot more bridesmaids than Tom had as groomsmen. The first night, the entire wedding party went out, and it became clear that Kelly wanted to hook up. I was not into her at all, so I kindly turned her down. She then starts interrogating me as to why. I try to give a generic answer, but she starts listing off all of the reasons why we are so perfect together. I end up saying that I don't do the whole short-term type thing, and as we both live in completely different states, there is no future here. She ends up cooling off, but then tells me that she respects me more for that, and that I am a stand-up guy, and the type of guy that she is looking for. <laughs> During the rest of the time we are there, one of the other unmatched bridesmaids, let's call her Jen, starts messaging me privately and we hit it off. The next day's wedding ceremony goes well, we have a reception, and me and Kelly do our entrance together and then dance together for a bit. After a bit, I go to the bar and Jen and I start to dance. At this point, Kelly is giving me dirty looks. I just ignore it and continue having a good time. All is well until when I'm at the bar. Kelly and Liz confront me and start saying that me dancing with Jen is inappropriate. They start saying she's too young for me and that it looks creepy. For what it's worth, I'm 32 and she is 24, about to turn 25. Ugh. I'm like, oh, it's okay, me and Jen are just friends. Liz at this point is angry with me and starts saying that Jen is in college, she is doing her masters, and that this is her wedding and she doesn't want to see that. Then Kelly starts saying that I must have a fetish for white women. At this point, I realize that there is no logical argument I can make. I tell Kelly and Liz that I really enjoyed the wedding, but I need to go to bed early for my flight the next day. I leave and go up to my hotel. Fifteen minutes later, Jen leaves early. Five minutes after Jen came up, we both got kicked out of the wedding party chat. I later find out from Tom that Kelly was crying her eyes out, and that it messed up the night for Liz as well. He told me that he isn't mad at me because he told Liz from the start that Kelly isn't going to be my type, but instead, Liz really wanted to set Kelly up. At this point, I feel terrible that I made it so Liz was not able to enjoy her special night. As for Kelly, I just wish she got no means no. Oh, you're not the a-hole. You're not the a-hole. Look, you do so much for a bride and a groom during their wedding. It is their special day, and yeah, you should cater to them. You should try and do nice stuff for them. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? You go an extra mile, whatever. From the title of this, I thought that you, like, switched out which bridesmaid you were with during, like, walking down the aisle and at the wedding. And that would have been like, oh, no, don't do that. You would have been the a-hole for sure. I was certain of it. But no, you did nothing wrong. You did the reception, the dinner, all correct. And then and then you just, you, you hung out with someone and you danced with someone else. That's the... Uh, brides, grooms, you can't control every little detail. Like, when you get to the part that's like the party and the celebration, if you're just like, no, no, you can't drink that, drink this. You can't dance with her, dance with her. You d No, that's not, a, that's not a good party for everyone. Now you just want a well-rehearsed play. And if you want to do that, become a director and put on a play that no one will go to because it sounds terrible. So, yeah, no, you're not an a-hole. 
Um, I don't necessarily think Kelly's an a-hole. Uh, Liz, kind of an a-hole. Liz, calm down. Calm down. Story two. Today, I effed up by being with a guy way too long without asking him his name. <laughs> I, 26 female, met this really good-looking guy, male, 28, at an event three months ago, and we really liked each other. For the rest of the night, we talked about the books we like, we talked about our families, etc., and there was a lot of connection. We ended the night with a kiss goodbye and got to know each other's socials. We told each other our names at first, but I have a huge problem with names because of my job. I meet 200 to 300 students every year. I think my mind has reached full capacity. I figured I could just see his name on his socials, but he has a nickname on his Instagram and just an emoji on his WhatsApp, so I couldn't learn. A few nights later, we went out for drinks, and I felt so embarrassed to ask his name since we kissed before, too. We kept seeing each other until now, and it's been almost three months. <laughs> We also slept together, and I think I'm starting to catch feelings also. I just don't know his name, and now it's embarrassingly late to ask him. Too long didn't read. Today I effed up by, asking, by taking way too long to ask a guy I'm seeing his name. Now I'm too embarrassed to ask. A. <laughs> uh, are you an A? Uh, am I the A? Um, I mean, you definitely effed up. You definitely effed up by not asking a few more times and saying, I'm sorry, I'm so bad with names. I do that all the time. But B, you've had opportunities. You slept together. You just sneak out and be like, I have to go to the bathroom. And you find a piece of his mail. You find his wallet, something. You look at his ID. <laughs> you do whatever you take. You can't admit it at this point. You can't. At three months, you can't. <laughs> you can't come up to someone that you... <laughs> that you've been interacting with and be like, I don't even know your actual name. I mean, what? No, I mean, I get it. You can talk with someone a lot without ever actually using their real name. Um, like, I even, sometimes when I talk to my partner, if I actually use her name, it almost feels weird because it's like, no, no, I always just call her, you know, love or we have cute nicknames that I'm not going to say on here. You don't need to know. Just give, give him a real cute nickname and just stick with that and be like, you'll always be this to me. <laughs> I want you to marry this person without knowing his name is what I'm saying. That's what I need to happen and we, I need an update <laughs> for what happens at the vows. That's a, that'll be the point where the priest is like, do you, Rebecca, take Scott? And she'll be, you'll be like, Scott! <laughs> Doctors and nurses, what was the creepiest last words you heard from a patient right before they died? Story one. I don't care that I'm not a nurse, but this was said to be by my dad to the nurse so close enough. Backstory. Dad had MS. He'd had it since he was 18. Diagnosed at 20, married my mom at 24, had me at 29, died 15 days short of 45. Six months before that, he was put on hospice. He and mom were discussing funeral arrangements, and my mom jokingly said, You know, Tim, the best thing you could do would be to die on a Wednesday. That way we can have the body prepared on Thursday, the viewing on Friday, and the memorial on Saturday so more people could come. The morning we got the call that it was time, my mom, two sisters, and I were about five minutes too late. After we said our goodbyes, the nurse pulled my mom aside and asked if that day had any significance. It's not even 6 a.m. yet, so mom doesn't even know what day it is, much less if it's important. The nurse tells her it's May 21st. No, nothing is coming to mind. The nurse told her that the previous day he kept asking what day it was, and they'd tell him it was the 20th. He'd look irritated, but accept it. That morning, he asked what day it was, and they said, It's Wednesday, May 21st. He smiled, squeezed his favorite nurse's hand, and was gone almost immediately. It was Memorial Day weekend, and we did just as he and Mom had planned. And despite many friends being out of town for the holiday, we had over 250 people show up at the memorial service, overflowing the tiny church more than it had been filled. To his dying day, he was trying to make things easier for our family. I miss him. Hey, out of this whole thread, this one got me the most. People who think of others in their last moments are really the example we should all live up to. Thanks for sharing. Hugs for you. I honestly think in those last moments, a lot of people think of others, and granted, not all of them can, you know, 
fulfill last wishes in that particular way. But uh, I think when you think you're dying, others kind of becomes primarily what you think of. And I will relay that to you by sharing my own I thought I was dying experience, but I'm going to save it for like the end of the video because it might be a little long. I know some people don't like my long comments, so somewhere near the end, I'll share my own. And I, I wasn't actually dying, folks. Don't worry, but yeah. Story two. Uh, I was a hospice nurse for many years. Super gratifying job for a nurse, surprisingly. As a regular nurse, you are rarely offered thanks. Hospice nursing is an island unto itself. Mostly peaceful, lots of times sad, often a blessing. This is sad, but also creepy, and I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't seen it. Had a 20-year-old kid gang member who was dying of primary liver cancer. Super unusual, aggressive, and terminal. He was angry at the universe. His family was there to comfort him, but he literally spit in their faces. Every ounce of energy he had left was angry and mean and ugly. His mom would beg him to lighten up and accept Jesus into his heart. He would swing at her and tell her to F herself. The family remained beside, and, and I hope he will chill out at the end. His last days, hours, moments, he was angry. The family called me into the room and told me they thought he was going. He wasn't responding. Shane strokes, breaths, eyes gloss, glossy and skin cold. The end was imminent. His lovely mother and her dearest attempt whispered to him to go towards the light, to her Jesus. With his dying breath, he opened his eyes, looked at her, and said, F your Jesus. A second or two later, he slowly turned his head to the left and got the most horrific look on his face, as if he was looking at something we couldn't see and horrified like in a bad movie. His face contorted and he screamed with his last breath, eyes wide, oh crap, oh crap, oh no, then made a guttural noise and promptly fell back into the bed and died. Every family member was shaking and too frightened to speak, and I left the room and took two days off. I don't care if I never find out what he saw. Well, he was angry at the idea of Jesus, right? So maybe Jesus showed up and took him to heaven, and now he's up there sitting in a corner scowling. I mean, that is certainly one interpretation. I don't know if I'd call it the right interpretation, but sure. Uh, I more imagine that he was just terrified of dying because I would be. Story 3. Came into an early shift and was handed over to a patient who'd been very anxious and had a panic attack overnight. He was anxious all morning, but was all fine, ECG fine, and so I just asked someone to sit with him to keep an eye on him and reassure him for me. He gets worse, really panicky, heavy breathing, he's on his side in the fetal position, doctors will be in in 10 minutes, so I tell him I'll get them to him as soon as they come in, but ask if he'll lie on his back for me to help his breathing. He tells me he won't make it until they get here, and that he won't face the other way. Obviously still all fine at this point, but he's more agitated, so again I suggest he move position for comfort, and that's when he says, I won't make it until the doctors get here. If I turn to face the other way, I'll die. He repeated this a few times to me. He was arrested literally as the doctors walked in, and he died on the side he'd been refusing to turn to. I'm convinced he knew. If I turn to face the other way, I'll die. That was my exact same thought the first time I had a panic attack. Story 4. My first code as a nurse was of a middle-aged mother who we think ended up having a brain bleed. I was trying to check her vitals, and she was super agitated and had been all day. She managed to bend her IV pole somehow. She was ripping her gown off and the sheets off the bed, and she'd yanked her heart monitor off. I was trying to start a blood transfusion, but needed to get her vitals beforehand, which was impossible because she wouldn't stay still long enough for any of it to read. I'd given her a sedative for what we thought was anxiety, and I was praying it would kick in soon. She kept grabbing my arm, saying, Come here, look at me, help me, with fear in her eyes that I will never forget. I'm pretty sure I snapped back, I'm trying, which I of course wish was something comforting instead. Then she leaned back, her eyes got droopy, she shut her mouth, then snapped her eyes wide open but totally glossed over. She took one last breath as a co-worker was helping me while I called the code. Patients with feelings of impending doom are a major red flag that scare the crap out of me. She was going to die and knew it. By the way, bending her IV pole? Super impressive. 
Story 5. I'm a nurse and was previously working at an assisted living community in the dementia-slash-Alzheimer's unit. My very favorite patient had been declining pretty steadily, so I was checking on him very frequently. We would have long chats and joke around with each other, but in the last two weeks of his life, he stopped talking completely and didn't really acknowledge conversation directed at him at all. I finished my medication rounds for the evening and went to see him before I left. I told him I was leaving for the night and that I'd see him the following day, and he looked me in the eyes and smiled so genuinely and said, You look like an angel. I thought it was so sweet because he had not seemed lucid in weeks. He died the next morning. It really messed with me. Wow, that put a tear in my eye, and I'm not the kind of guy to have that happen to me. You obviously had a pretty positive effect on the final weeks of that man's life. Hold your head up high. Folks who work in the dementia and Alzheimer's unit of uh, assisted living homes are are angels to me. They're incredible. Um, I once trained as a certified nursing assistant, and I had to do essentially like a residency type thing for a week, and I did it at a local nursing home, and I worked in the Alzheimer's and dementia unit. And that is a hard unit to work in. I can see how it can be rewarding as you get to know these people and you bring them comfort. But over the course of the week, it terrified me um, of just the idea of Alzheimer's and dementia and stuff. It's very, very hard to work with. And if you're doing that work and bringing those people some light, thank you so much. That is not an easy job. And you're amazing. Story six. I found one of my comfort measures only patients standing at the side of his bed. It surprised me because he had been mostly unresponsive during my shift. I helped him back into bed and he asked me why all these people were in his room. He suddenly became quiet again and I noticed he wasn't breathing. He was a DNR so there wasn't anything to do to try to bring him back. Looking back, he may have been talking about me and the CNA that was helping me get him back into bed, but who knows what or who he was seeing in the last minutes of his life. Still creeps me out a little when I think about it. My father-in-law sat at his mother's bedside for days as she was dying. She was in and out of it and spent a lot of time in conversation with her parents and siblings, who were all long dead. One of the last intelligible things she said was, Leave the gate open, Rodney. I'm coming. Story 7. I actually have three that stick out in my mind. An 83-year-old woman that said, My mom's here, are we going? She died a few minutes later. Another older lady said, I think I'm going to die today. We took vitals. Everything seemed fine. She was stable. She had a heart attack a couple hours later. Not her last words, but the last she ever said to me. The last one is definitely the creepiest. A nice old lady who told my CNA she wanted to wear all white. When asked why, she said, the man in black is here. She looked in the corner of the room. The CNA looked, but there was no one there. That's when I came into the room. We asked her to describe what she was seeing, and she said, He's in all black, and he's got a top hat on. Then she whispered, and his eyes are red, while her eyes moved across the room directly behind the CNA like she was watching him move closer to us. She died later that night, but it was unexpected. That room creeped me out for a long time after that. Sounds like she was talking about the hat man. That is creepy as frick. Story 8. Not a nurse or doctor, but my beloved grandpa was in the hospital ill with pneumonia and sepsis. I thought he would recover. He was asking to see me and my family, so I went with my parents, my husband, and my two little boys. Grandpa couldn't talk, but he was lucid and was watching TV in his room. He motioned for a pen and paper. He scribbled something on a scrap of paper and gave it to my oldest boy, who was about 12 at the time. It said, I love you. When we were leaving the hospital, it hit me that Grandpa was saying goodbye, and I started to bawl like a baby. Grandpa had passed before I got home. He held on just to see me and my boys one more time. I still see him in my dreams, only he isn't the sick old man I had known since my grandma died in 1977. He is about 40, in the prime of his life. He's healthy and strong, taking long, energetic strides across the front yard of the house he shared with my grandma for 45 years. I have never known him to look like that, and yet there he is, popping in to say hello. It's funny that you say he's popping by to say hi. A lot of people I know believe that when you dream of the dead, they're actually coming to visit you. You know, I might not believe in any real religion, and I'm pretty certain that there is no after... Well, not certain, but I don't believe in any particular afterlife. But I would like to believe that we can at least live on in the memories of others and bring them some comfort. And, 
If we do live on in some way, I'll definitely come back and uh, visit some friends and family members. Might haunt a few of them just for giggles, but mostly it'll be positive. Story 9. My brother died just a little over two years ago from cancer. He was a medical doctor. I'm a PhD of history, so I guess we've got it covered. As we were in the hospice room of the hospital, my friend came in to visit on you slash goon's last day. He was a Redditor too. And goon says, my heart, my heart is under the TV in the room. Bob goes, it's cool, man. Don't worry about it. No, my heart. It's under the TV. He died later that night. A couple days later, we were gathering up his stuff and found his stash of pot under his TV. LOL. He seemed to want to tell my friend because that's who was procuring pot for him. Never smoked before he was diagnosed and had fun with that during his treatment. Story 10. Nurse here. Had a patient come into the ER with shortness of breath. He started deteriorating in the ER and then quite rapidly on the transport up the ICU. We got him wheeled into his room, replaced the ER lines and tubes with our own, and transferred him from the transport stretcher to his ICU bed. He actually did most of the transfer himself. He didn't say anything, but just before he died, he pleasantly adjusted his pillow, laid his head down, and then his eyes went blank. This man just made himself comfortable before laying down to die. Story 11. My dad fell into unconsciousness around noon. We managed to get him into bed, and he responded with a hand squeeze when I said, I love you. We watched and waited for the rest of the day. Around 3 a.m., his breathing changed, and as his breathing became more and more labored, he bolted upright, eyes wide open, looked at his wife, my sister, then me, smiled, exhaled, and died. Story 12. My first hospice case. She was on morphine and started mock smoking. She looked at me, took my hand, and said, please, in the most pleading voice I've ever heard. I sat with her body until the coroner arrived. She had no friends or family. Only her lawyer showed up. I've only done one hospice case since. That's so sad. She must have been so lonely. Story 13. Get home safe, little one. It wasn't what he said. He said the same thing to me any time I had him as a patient for the evening. It was how he said it. He gave me this look and paused like he knew. The DNRs in my experience always know when it's time. It's creepy. Relieved. They're relieved when it comes. Most of my patients were older and usually happy that they might see their friends and family again. Relieved that the pain will be gone and that they won't be lonely ever again. Speaking of, if you have older relatives that aren't buttholes, please visit them. They miss you. I think it can be really hard for a lot of folks who are younger. I mean, even me, I'm middle-aged, and I don't totally get the idea of being, like, ready and relieved to finally die. Most of us think, no, I want to hang on for anything. But for some of these folks, they've lived a full life, or maybe they're suffering with something and just want the peace of it all. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, I think over time, things that some of us view of creep as creepy, just kind of become a comforting inevitability. What's your best idiot neighbor story? Story one. I was off sick one day and my roommate came home for lunch and checked the mail. We got a letter with no return address sent to the rooftop pot smokers with our address on it. We knew it was for our next door neighbor since one of them had a chair on the roof and smoked up there. Since it had no actual name and our address on it, I was like, heck yeah, I'm gonna open this and it'll be hilarious. As I'm opening the taped envelope, a little bit of white powder sprinkled onto my lap. My roommate and I looked at each other and were like, uh, what the F? So I got up and took the letter outside to open it. A crap ton of white powder came out of the letter when we took it out of the envelope, so we grabbed a Ziploc bag and some tongs and sealed up the letter. The letter was typed and said random crap like, To the butthole who likes smoking pot on the roof and yelling at people on the street with kids, you'd better have good insurance because I'll damage your stuff. I'm ex-military and have nothing better to do than watch over you. You peed off the wrong guy, blah, 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 blah. And at the end it said, by the way, the substance in this envelope is toxic, so you might want to get yourself to a hospital. Who's the mother sucker now? At that point, we were half laughing, half concerned, so I called the cops just in case. They took it very seriously and sent out everyone. Cops, paramedics, fire trucks, RCMP, my roommate works for them, and the tactical unit, our version of SWAT. 
The street was closed off, we were quarantined to our garage, and every neighbor who was home at the time came out to take a look. Everyone was told to go back inside and stay put. The tactical team got suited up in hazmat suits and went into our house to test the letter and envelope. We were in the garage for almost three hours. The tactical guys came back out and said the substance was found to be non-toxic, but they still had to do some more tests to figure out exactly what it was. At that point, we were taken into the ambulance for a lookover and then back to the garage. Turns out the white powder was friggin' pancake mix. My roommate and I, along with the cops and tactical guys, burst out laughing together. We thanked the response team, and they left. The police stayed behind to get our statements and questioned the next-door neighbors to whom the letter was supposed to be sent. A detective followed up with us a couple of times. Since it was a threat and sent through the mail, it was a serious offense. The letter slash envelope was sent off to forensics for testing. Unfortunately, nothing was found, and the case was closed. The people in that house caused some crap the entire time they lived there, noise complaints, trash left everywhere outside, etc., but this incident really takes the cake. Luckily, they have all since moved out. D-bags. I, I mean, A, pretty wild story. That would have been uh, very concerning and then very funny as it was for you afterwards, but... I'm a little bit confused as to why this makes those neighbors d -bay. you know? They weren't the ones who did this. They weren't the one. They, they were going to be the victims of this incident. And granted, the guy being on the roof and shouting at people was the cause of this letter, but I still don't think you can place most of the blame on them for this one. So I don't know if this one takes the cake for them in my book. Story 2. I had a neighbor on our old street who were pretty sure was on some serious drugs. When we first moved there, he wanted to invite us to a barbecue, but we declined because we were still busy unpacking and said, maybe another time. A few months later, we hear a woman in distress and it turns out he was beating his wife in the middle of the street. We called for her to come over here so she could call the police or whatever. The wife left him and some drama between both of them throughout the years, it's irrelevant to us though. Because our family helped his wife, we were his enemy and he harassed us multiple times throughout the years. We'd call the police and they'd come out and basically have to stop him for a time. At one point, he bought a megaphone and started yelling threats and swears at us. Another time, he started driving his motorcycle around our neighborhood to annoy us and then used the motorcycle's back tire to throw dirt and rocks at our car. We called the police, who told him, don't do this again. He denied he ever did it in the same breath that he said he did because my mom is evil. A few years later, I go to get the mail and I hear him talking to his one to two year old child, basically telling the child, the woman over there is evil, never trust her, referring to my mom. I tell my mom and she's thinking, oh boy, what's he up to now? Later that afternoon, he drives by our house very slowly and stops staring into our living room window. He later goes home and uses his megaphone to insult my mom and yell threats at us again. One specific threat being, you better not leave your kids alone or something will happen to them. My mom calls the police. They recommend a restraining order. The next day, and his wife calls us saying her kids heard him saying he was going to get a restraining order against us. We filed one at the same time, so we had the same court date. He told the court that my mom had been training me and my siblings and an unnamed teenaged boy to climb his fence and go into his tree at night to harass him, and one night he caught us and we all ran back into our house at my mom's orders. Apparently, we only harassed him when his kids were at his ex-wife's. He basically spouted insanity throughout the entire court hearing, and the judge asked for our side of the story, and we told him. The judge asked if our neighbor was taking any meds, and he told the judge, yes, I was taking antipsychotics, but I stopped them. The judge then told him that my family would never bother him again and granted us our restraining order. Dude was completely insane. I worry about how those kids of his turned out. I hate to say it, but that neighbor sounds like a pretty awful person. Like, to be turning his kids against you and, like, to yelling at you with a megaphone and stuff, that's... That is the behavior from, like, a sitcom, a bad sitcom, uh, but with an actual person who's just being really kind of gross and probably messing up his kids and everything, and just also clearly a bad person, so... Ugh, sorry I had to live by someone like that. 
Story 3. I had a neighbor with a drag racing car. At the time, we didn't have AC. Like clockwork, at dinner time, he would start the car and revved it so loud my windows rattled. If we had any windows open because it was summer, we wouldn't be able to have dinner conversation. One day, I'd had enough. I walked to the fence and got his attention and politely asked if he could maybe not rev the car at dinner time. I said I was cool with it otherwise. His answer was, Frick you! Frick me? <laughs> okay, I went inside and called the police and filed a noise complaint. They came out, heard it live, and wrote him up. He fought it in court, so I had to go. Judge asked me what happened. I told the story above. She asked him and his wife if it was true. They said, yes. Boom. $1,000 fine. Judge told me to call the police if it continued. To be clear, I wasn't wasting 911 time. I was calling the non-emergency ordinance enforcement number. All Dumbutt had to do was avoid one hour a day and we'd have been fine. I never called again because he didn't rev during dinner. One day, his common-law wife gets in my face about calling again. I told her I didn't, but she wouldn't believe me. He got hit with a second $1,000 fine. Turns out it was the neighbor two houses away who was a migraine sufferer and had similarly tried the neighborly approach first. They're lucky they just got a fine from the other neighbor. As a fellow migraine sufferer, when my mind isn't functioning on all cylinders, I'd probably have taken a bat to the car. Story 4. I have crazy neighbors. They are actually very nice as neighbors go, but the family is totally dysfunctional. They have two grown-up daughters living there along with their teenage daughters and their boyfriends. One has a kid. There are roughly 10 people living there ranging from 5 to 70. They keep the yard mode and keep to themselves mostly, but they are bat crap insane. I like them, actually, for two reasons. First, they are notorious and crazy around our town, so everyone leaves them alone, so there is little crime around us. Second, they are entertainment. One morning, my aunt was visiting. We're on the front porch, and I'm telling her about all the neighbors. I was telling her a story about how one of the younger granddaughters gets in a fight with her boyfriend at 2 a.m. on a Tuesday night. They're screaming at each other, walking up and down the street, explaining that something like that happens once a week. Like clockwork, one of the daughters comes out screaming back at someone and gets in her car. Her daughter comes out and tries to stop her from backing out. She grabs a shovel from the back of the truck and starts hitting the front windshield of the car, stuttering it. They call the cops. Meanwhile, the granddaughter with the shovel calls her bio dad who lives down the road. He picks his daughter up. Two minutes later, the cops show up, but she's gone. I have hundreds like this. Your front lawn is like an episode of Dr. Phil or Maury Povich. I almost envy you. See, I was going to say this sounds kind of like that show that I haven't seen all of it. I've only seen little bits when my partner's watching. Um, no, what's the name? The na uh, it, William H. Macy. He's there, but it was based on a British show, I think. There, uh, uh, shameless, shameless. It sounded like shameless to me. Probably isn't anything like that because I don't know. I don't know much about the show, but maybe. Story five. I had a problem with a neighbor who drove over my lawn with his ATVs and damaged the grass and shrubs. He said he'd pay for the damage, but that never happened, and he kept doing it. So I put my huge trailer across their tracks to block their path. They went around it. I put up two other barriers that they also drove around. So I found this huge branch that had fallen in the woods between our properties and dragged it across to cover the third path they were making across my yard. But the branch got caught on a cable. What's a cable doing over the lawn instead of properly buried? So I called the cable company to have it buried. They said I was the only registered client on that box and to disconnect it. So I did. After the weekend, my neighbor came by going total ape crap at me for disconnecting his cable. He yelled he was going to call the cops on me. So I left. I got a call from the cops. Cops asked if I disconnected the cable because of the ATV issue. Interesting. I wasn't even going to mention the ATV issue, but my neighbor already did. So, long story short, the neighbor got a warning ticket for trespassing and admitted to stealing cable. I took an offer on my house that very day and moved. That guy is a friggin' dumb butt, calling the cops for the crime he committed. I wonder how many times this happens. Honestly, it sounds like you had a lot more patience than I would have. I would have started, like, leaving long darts out and everything to, like, pop their tires and screw them over in that way. Nothing that would get them hurt, but, you know, 
I, I, I would have been like, no, if you're going to drive through my lawn, I'm, I'm going to ruin your things. Because um, what, what absolute jerks and what idiots. What is the petty thing you do to break the system that may or may not actually have any effect? Story one. My place of work automatically shuts off our computers if they're left on after a certain time to save power. They only do this if you have left your computer on after a certain time. My second third week at my job, I forgot to shut it down before I left, so they added me to the list and my computer shuts off automatically at 6 p.m. every night. A month or two after I was added to the list, I had to stay after normal working hours to enter some information. Lo and behold, the damaged computer, the damned computer shuts off. The program I'm using doesn't have a save function, so I had to re-enter the data. It took me 30 frickin' minutes to do the first time around. Next day, I ask if they could stop turning my computer off so I don't have to worry about it screwing me over again. Apparently they can't, because they're worried about me wasting company power. So now, every day before I leave, I pull out the network cable. They can't turn off my computer if it's not on the network. So I frickin' win. I've been doing this for two years now, and I'm sure that no one gives a rat's butt, but frick this system. Sounds like crappy sys admins. You can configure the computers to automatically suspend or shut down after a period of activity instead of forcefully shutting down PCs at a particular time. Now, is it really crappy sys admin or is it just lazy sys admin? Which, okay, debatably, you could say that those are basically the same thing, but I mean, lazy sys admin just, you know might be lazy because their job sucks, and that doesn't mean they're necessarily bad at it, they just don't want to do it. You know, like most of us. Story 2. I worked at a call center doing credit repair, and people wanted to get homes with credit ratings under a 620, which a uh, 640 is where most big banks will start working with you. Under that, they'll ream you or say, sorry, can't help. I used to get calls from clients saying they had minor bills preventing them from getting their home. Well, there is something most people don't know. If you ask these bill collectors to send you original paperwork of your alleged debt with your original signature, you'd be happy to pay, but these companies just pay for your contact info and know what you owe, so if they did try to get you the original paperwork, nine times out of ten, it takes more than 30 days, and they have exactly 30 days to do so, or the debt is written off, so to speak. Doing so, I helped well over 30 families move from their crappy hole apartments to the home they wanted, all due to $40 medical bills holding their credit score down a few minor points. I could give a lot of advice to help with raising or maintaining your credit score. To be fair, credit scores just suck. And I say that with, as someone who, after a lot of years of having a bad credit score, actually has a pretty decent one now, but oh my gosh, was it awful for the longest time because they let 18 year olds take out credit cards and stuff and college loans. Do you have any idea what a bad idea that is? Especially 18 year old me? Oh God, it's all, it's all terrible. But folks, if you're younger, if you're gonna be an adult, learn to play the credit score game because it's a lot of hassle in your life if you don't. Story 3. I live in Toronto, and city parking here is done through a pay terminal that prints paper tickets. I was driving to work and paying $9 a day to park and having to line up for five minutes at the machine every morning while other people paid. I work as a graphic designer, so I saved a bunch of slips, scanned them in, and built a font out of the various numbers and letters on the ticket. I got a programmer friend to make a script that generates a ticket for whatever date entered. Now I print off a week's worth of tickets on the color laser at work, snip them on the paper cutter, and park all week for free. There is only one unique identifier on the ticket I can't forge, a number generated at the bottom of the ticket. I tuck that part under the black liner on the edge of the windshield. Voila, 200 bucks a month saved. That's improved by the fact that parking tickets in Toronto are often cheaper than parking legally in my experience. Story 4. Whenever I fill out a survey for some random service or product, question, what did you like best about the product or service? Answer, the donuts. Question, what did you like least about the product or service? Answer, the beatings. Question, do you have any additional comments? Answer, more donuts, less beatings. I'm dumb as frick and this makes me giggle endlessly. 
I work as data entry for a market research company, and thank you. It's fun to read that kind of thing. Story 5. In Canada, when we do our taxes, you have to make over $200 on your refund or the government won't send you a check. So if I'm supposed to get back $1.99, the government says, whoops, sorry, you don't get this because it's not worth our time. However, if I owe the government even a penny, they want it. So every year I end up owing about 11 cents, but I never pay them. I just wait until they send me the letter that says they want the money, and I win right there. I made you spend more than 11 cents asking me for the 11 cents. Frick the man. This does not cost the government, it costs the taxpayers, meaning you and others like you. I mean, first off, yeah, I think the person commenting is right. You are just costing the taxpayers a small fraction of money. But also, for costing them a tiny amount of money that they aren't noticing at all, the minuscule amount of time you're wasting doing this is probably costing you more, because I assume your time is worth something, uh, probably more than <laughs> than what this is worth, but... I don't know, if it makes you happy, I guess it's worth it. Story 6. In high school, they got rid of the lockers, then made a no backpacks in the library rule. So we had to leave our bags with all our worldly possessions by the front door and walk back and forth if we needed stuff. Not a huge deal, but kinda lame. They told us it was to prevent theft of library books. So my friends and I began walking out with a book or two every day and collecting them in the trunk of one of our cars. When one friend walked out with the big dictionary that sits on a little pedestal, we figured we had done enough. We arrived at school early one morning and put all the books through the after-hours drop box, they barely fit, with a note explaining that we stole them all without a backpack. The rule was rescinded. Story 7. I work at a popular Italian food chain restaurant that hands out Andy's mints to their guests at the end of the meal. The way it's supposed to work is every guest at the table is supposed to get one mint because the cost of the mints is calculated into the cost of the meal to balance everything out. I regularly gave out handfuls of the dang things to my tables, especially if they have kids who are actually nice, or if I have regulars or friends sit at my table, I'll take a small to-go box and fill it with them and write lasagna on top so no one is the wiser. We get told to treat our guests like family, and my family eats a crap ton of Andy's candies. That's the best part about Olive Garden. There's a best part about Olive Garden? Story 8 I used to get all these customer surveys when I was in college. They were questionnaires about what stuff you bought in the household and how much and what you like to buy, etc. I started filling them out as if a large family of Polynesians lived there. I wrote about how much we wished we could get poi and stuff at Walmart. I would also get the ones my neighbors had and fill them out the same way. Lo and behold, one day I went into Walmart and there is now a Polynesian food section. This was in the middle of Tennessee, by the way. You better be eating that dang poi. Story 9. I saw something similar already mentioned, but after being email bombed slash call bombed slash mail bombed after asking for a car quote online, I found a way to wreak petty vengeance. Whenever a company asks for my info online for something I don't need, for example a car quote, I enter their own info back into them. I have no idea if someone catches this, but the thought of them wasting their resources harassing themselves is enough to make me feel better. They might catch their own information, but they certainly won't catch each other's. Okay, normally I wouldn't say that you should be, like, bothering these people and making their lives harder because it's just normal people working for a lot of these things. But for these, like, companies that call you after you ask for a quote for a car loan or something like that, no, no, they're all monsters. I'm sorry, it's, it's terrible, but I've done this once in my life, and the calls are awful, and the people were not nice about things, so I think I support this. Story 10. I work in a huge mall in the suburbs. They have started charging for parking. If you spend over $150, you get to park for free. The fee is not a lot, $3 a day for staff, but that crap adds up, and they're making money off all the poor retail assistants who are going through university or don't really have a lot. 
Not to mention that it's like three blocks away from anywhere, so every time I work, I go and validate parking for people. If any of the staff want me to, I'll put through the $150 and they can go and validate it, and then I'll return the items. Frick you, Westfield. Story 11. The sandwich franchise I work for is owned by a colossal and successful D-head. We had some of the highest turnaround rates because the company does not care about keeping employees and would prefer you quit without notice to giving you a raise. I like to get sloppy with how much bacon should be on a sandwich, how much avocado spread, give free crap out all the time, and generally do everything I can to make them lose money. It's possible you're making him money by increasing customer satisfaction. What is an addiction society pretends is a necessity? Story 1. Weed. I'm a former stoner, and honestly, my life is so much better sober. Yet so many people act like smoking weed all the time isn't really that bad, and it's basically medicine. Nah, fam, you're emotionally dependent. I still smoke occasionally, but I don't miss weed being an everyday thing. Edit. My first gold. Thank you. Edit to, just to be clear, I'm not saying weed has no medicinal value whatsoever, I'm more poking fun at people who have a dependency because it feels nice, and using its medicine as an excuse to feed their habit. Was a full-time stoner too, guess we had to go through it to see it on the other side. There's this drug culture of getting effed up and being self-deprecating, knowing there's something emotional that needs tending to, but deciding to tell other people that they'd rather just smoke because there's something stoic about battling with their issues. People think it's necessary to smoke so much, telling people how much they smoke. I always stayed high, but I'd take a hit maybe every 30 minutes or so. It's really all you need. Anybody going off about their habit was slash is annoying. I used to get high pretty often, but for some reason it started making me paranoid, so I just stopped, and I don't really mind. My lungs are happier for it, and my brain is a little bit clearer. Sometimes I feel like I'm missing out, but my bank account is better for not smoking. Yeah, this is one of those things where I say moderation is kind of key, and only if you're really even interested in doing that, and it's legal where you're at, do it legally. But, you know, I enjoy, you know, some weed every once in a while, and uh, yeah, it can be a lot of fun. But boy, like, like so many things in life, if you let it become just this everyday thing, it becomes kind of a dependency, and it can kind of mess around with you. So... I don't know. Everyone's got to make their own judgment calls on stuff like that. Uh, but, yeah. Story 2. Some people are addicted to comparing their lives to others when they should really strive to be the best they can be. Trying to outperform others leads to endless frustration, but trying to outperform yourself leads to true improvement. Coming from an overthinker, I completely agree. I'm also an overthinker, and that comment hit me hard. Even seeing improvement in myself, hell, even others noticing it too, you would think that would be enough for me. But goddamn, I hate that I'm always comparing myself to others that are better. It's so damn hard to shake the frustration, disappointment, self-loathing. Hate it. Wish I could just not have those thoughts and constant comparisons. Used to never happen. In my circle sometimes, I used to be the best person at fill in the blank. Now with the internet being so prominent, comparing yourself to hundreds of thousands of others is effing depressing. I need to start meditating regularly again. I always strive to outperform myself and improve, and I do, but the horrible thoughts of there always being people who will forever be way better than I ever could at something just destroys all of my pride. Honestly, I think they really hit on someone with comparing this to, like, the internet and social media and stuff. People are always posting about every accomplishment they make on there, and then, you know, weighing the success of that based on, like, how many views and likes that you get for posting that stuff. And it's kind of awful. Like, I grew up in the time where that wasn't really the thing, but it's slowly become a thing, and it does affect me too, but, folks, you gotta just... Not compare yourself to all that stuff, because A, a lot of those people posting all their, like, amazing accomplishments online have all of their own struggles that you're not reading about. They might be dealing with so much more other crap that you're not. You, you don't know. People are mostly sharing, like, their biggest accomplishments. Sometimes there are some people who just go on the internet to complain. But seriously, don't get caught up in what other people are doing. Just... Try and better yourself, do the best that you can, and focus on you, and I think you'll just be happier.
Story three, being too connected with friends or social media. You don't need to be constantly on your phone and stop what you're doing every five minutes to look at your phone. Friends are great. Spending time with friends is great. Seeking validation every five minutes from virtual acquaintances you don't care about is the opposite of great. Yes, I'm realizing I'm saying this while literally trying to impress strangers on this site. The irony isn't lost on me. Even so, it's not that social interaction is bad, it's just that the virtual kind is often of such low quality that you'd be happier doing something else. This is what social media has turned into in my family. I am so upset! I liked 100 pictures of so-and-so's baby and now that I have a new grandchild, I get no likes back? Why take it out on a little innocent baby? The baby has no idea this is even happening and please get a life! I said this to my mother. She really needs to get the hell off Facebook. Now. Story 4. Trying to look the best on social media. I don't get it and never will. I went dog sledding yesterday for my birthday. It was a nice zen meditative ride while someone else steered. Dude said he would have some people browsing Instagram while on the sled, not even posting, just browsing. Killed me a little inside since I had just brought a little camera to record it for me, myself, and I to look back on. I didn't even really look at my camera while on, just held it and admired the beauty around me while I hoped there was something being captured for future me. He was obviously speaking with some salty undertones about the social media addicts. Oh boy, yeah, right after I mentioned social media, there we go. A couple stories about people being addicted to social media. And I tell you folks, I've cut back a lot. Um, thankfully, Elon made it real easy for me to just quit Twitter. <laughs> So that's been great. And I took Facebook and stuff off my phone because I didn't like looking at it anyway. It's mostly just relatives, half of which are... Uh... But yeah, no, life can be better when social media is a much more infrequent, moderate thing. Story five. And expensive weddings. That crap is not normal. Because of COVID, my 2020 wedding had to be postponed along with all the vendors and banquet hall. When our new date came around 2021, my then fiancé and I decided that the most important thing was that our marriage was certified. We had our ceremony on our new date, canceled all of our vendors except for our photographer and videographer, and spent the day with our closest people. And by the time 5.30 came around, we cut into our homemade cake while wearing track pants. I wouldn't trade our day for the world. Edit. Thanks for the awards, kind strangers. I'm reading lots of comments about how others did the same thing, and I'm glad we're not the only ones. Being Italian Canadians, weddings are a huge deal with 200 plus people invited. Looking back though, I'm glad we did the low key thing and put the money we saved into our house and fur baby. Story 6 Working oneself to death. Edit. This comment blew up way more than I ever expected. Thank you all for the upvotes and awards. One of my favorite related quotes, you'll never hear someone on their deathbed say they regret they didn't work more. Edit. There's a lot of replies of examples that disprove this quote. It could be interpreted in many ways, but what I mean is in regards to working oneself to death specifically. Same job, constant overtime, working on days off or while sick, etc. Regretting not getting an education or working your way up in a career is different. I think we've all had those relatives who'd tell us at young ages to go to college because they regret never going. We should always strive to accomplish more. Story 7. The entire side hustle culture. I understand the need and desire and do it myself too, but I find it insane that we need to monetize almost every waking moment. Edit, holy crap, thanks for the first awards ever, guys. Also, please excuse me while I go look into moving to the UK. So many replies saying this isn't really a thing there. Some of these side hustles aren't feasible to do long term, especially here in Canada. In my opinion, hustle culture came about because of crappy traditional jobs with little pay or benefits like flexible time. Just my opinion, though, might be wrong about this. If it wasn't the sole cause, it was certainly a contributing factor. No need to hustle if your primary income source already meets all of your needs and enough of your wants. Boy, oh boy, this story and the one before it about like side hustle and working yourself to the bones, like there are some people who take so much pride in being like, for instance, my brother working construction for years, like he's cut back now and I'm happy for him because there were years where he was like, you know, talking great about like, yep, we're con construction. We got more 70 hour work weeks coming up and not just 70 hours of work, but like 
back-breaking work, sometimes literally for some of those folks. Like, he was constantly laid up and in pain from working himself to the bone, spending all of his money on, you know, like, whatever, just to feel better from working so hard. And he'd talk about, like, yeah, I'm making all this money, but that way I can retire early. Yeah, cool. Uh, you'll have to retire early because you're gonna be broken. <laughs> like, you know, work hard on the stuff that you're passionate about. Sure, try and accomplish things, but man, I hope that you don't have to just work to live. Or no, don't live to work, work to live. That's the saying. Story 8. Alcohol. I'm a doctor, and when I ask if someone smokes, they say no, smugly. When I ask if they drink, they gush and joke about how happily they do so. Alcohol is pretty much the worst DI, in my opinion. It's devastating. My wife is a recovering alcoholic, and we used to fight about it a lot. I finally told her I wouldn't mention it ever again as long as she told her doctor the actual number of drinks she had per day. You think I'm overreacting? Tell your doc. If she says it's fine, I'll shut up. Of course, she came home looking queasy with a script for naltrexone and a stack of pamphlets. She didn't believe it was that bad. Alcohol is absolutely devastating. How many drinks was it? Don't mean to get personal, but the answer can put it into perspective for the drinkers out here. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.